during those days. Now, uh, you're going to enjoy a special number uh, at this time by Brother Jerry Rugg, I'm sure. Free from the law, oh, glorious calling, Jesus hath bled, and there is remission. Bruised by the law, and bruised by the fall, grace hath redeemed us once for all. Once for all, oh, sinner, receive. Once for all, oh brother, believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Grace has redeemed us once for all. Now we are free, there's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. Come unto me, oh, hear his sweet call. Come and he saves us once for all. Children of God, oh, glorious calling. Surely his grace will keep us from falling passing from death to life at his call blessed salvation once for all once for all oh sinner receive it once for all Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Grace hath redeemed us once for all. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jerry. That song has the gospel in it, and I'm sure you enjoyed it. Page 195 in the hymn book now. 195. We're going to stand together and sing again, and then the message in just a moment or two. Once for all, oh sinner, believe it. And you receive Christ, do that one time. He died one time. You get saved one time. You birth into God's family one time. Once for all. 195. May we stand together now. Everybody, you folk in the balcony, get a hold of a hymn book. Sing with Brother Horn in the choir now in a great congregational number. Brother Horn. On the very first word, together. <laughs> the second stanza as the last. Seated. That's what we're trying to do here today. I will glory in Jesus' name since I have been redeemed. And certainly we do that by the grace of God. Will you open your Bible uh, to two texts of Scripture? 28th chapter of Matthew, number 1, and verse number 20. Matthew 28 and verse number 20. And number 2, Hebrews 5, verse 11. Now, I read the second Scripture a few Sundays ago as I tried to bring a message to you from Hebrews 6, verses 4, 5, and 6. But I'd like to read the text again, beginning with verse 11 in chapter 5 
of the Hebrew epistle. I'd like to speak to you in this hour uh, on the ministry of teaching. The ministry of teaching. Now, I, I, thought, I hope that you're getting uh, my sermons lined up in your mind, and I hope that you're seeing what I'm trying to do for the past several Sundays from the pulpit on Sunday morning. I brought a message a few Sundays ago on the text in Proverbs 11:30, he that winneth souls is wise. Then the next Sunday I brought a message on uh, New Testament evangelism, what evangelism amounts to, what evangelism is in that message. Then I brought a message to you the following Sunday on fellowship, the ministry of fellowship, trying to show to you that the fruit of a church program is more than one. But the fruit of a church program is soul winning. The fruit of a church program is evangelism. And the fruit of a church program uh, is fellowship. And then last Sunday, I brought a message on the ministry of music. The fruit of a church program is music. Now make no mistake about it. The only singing people in all the world are Christian people. Pagan people do not sing. They chant and they mourn, but they don't sing. But God's people sing with a positive key and with an upbeat, a joyful noise, the Bible says. Singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Down here, not necessarily through your lip, but down in your heart, you make melody. God's people alone are characterized by that kind of singing around the world. And I tried to remind you that on last Sunday. It's not a byproduct. It's not a means to the end. I, I told Brother Horn last night, it was talking about uh, my sermon last Sunday and uh, then again today, that I think sometimes people get the idea that, uh, that music is simply a preparation for the preaching. And I, I never have liked that idea. And I never have used that terminology. I never have so classified singing as a means to an end. Uh, just a, a stepping stone, like coming from the floor of the church up to the platform, you take one step of music, another step of fellowship, another step of this or the other, and you finally get to the platform. I don't, I don't look at it like that. As far as I'm concerned, music is a vital part of our fellowship, and a vital part of our worship, and a real product of our uh, being born again, you see. Music is vital. It's not just a preparation for the preacher, and our preparation to get your heart in tune, but it's worship. I go to a lot of churches and they don't have any music until the clock strikes that magic hour of 7.30. Everything is dead and silent and the people are whispering, they're, they're sitting uh, in silence, no fellowship, no activity until finally 7.30 and then they start the music. I'd rather start that music a little early and uh, get the people uh, in the tune, get the people in the spirit, set the atmosphere for the good singing that we're going to have and not take it cold, you see. But anyway, a music is a means to its own end. A music is worship, it's sad. And men can worship God by singing and making melody in their heart unto the Lord. And then I'd like to speak today on the ministry of teaching. And I'm going to try to show you that this also is not a byproduct, but a main product, a main line, a, great, a main purpose of a local church assembly is the matter of teaching the word of God as well as soul winning or as well as evangelism or as well as fellowship or as well as music. We have the commission and the responsibility to teach our children and our people uh, the things of God. The whole counsel of the Lord is involved in the matter of teaching. Now the whole point is that I don't want you to get the idea that only one thing is the fruit of a born-again experience. I've heard it said in my life that the fruit of a Christian is another Christian, and that narrows everything down to evangelism. I've heard it said one time from the pulpit uh, that uh, evangelism solves all the problems of any local church. Well, now that sounds real good, but you'd have a hard time finding a proof text out of the Bible for that idea. Now, I'm not anti-evangelistic. God knows, I believe, in reaching the souls of men, and I believe in evangelizing, I've even so went in. But I say to you, the fruit of a church, the fruit of a local church, is far more wide and varied than simply evangelism, you see. And a church that sets out with that one fruit is not apt to grow 
a strong church. Not apt to grow a strong congregation. Because there are other things that are equally important, you see, very important as far as the local assembly is concerned. Why did God institute the local church? When Jesus started saving people, preaching to people, and John began baptizing people, why didn't the Lord just leave it at that particular point? Why did the disciples assemble together on the first day of the week? What was the idea of a communion supper table when the Lord sat around the table with his twelve? Why? Why did the disciples worship down by the river when Lydia, the seller of purple, found her way to that congregation of believers and worshiped God? Why? Why did they do that? Down through the dark ages, the born again people in the early years of the Christian church sometimes met behind closed doors because of the threat of the Roman Caesars and Roman religion. Why did they go to that kind of trouble? Back in the days of the Inquisition, our people, our Baptist people called Anabaptists in that ancient day a thousand years ago were hunted down like animals and they had to flee their homes and flee their native land and find refuge in the mountains of Switzerland and Bohemia and other European nations, mountainous places where they could hide from the powers to be because they wanted the privilege of assembly and the privilege of preaching and the privilege of fellowship and the privilege of worship as a congregation. Why didn't the Lord just let John baptize converts and forget it? Well, you know why. If you'll think for a moment, God has an eternal purpose in the institution of the church. The church is God's economy. The church is God's will. There's no doubt in my mind about that. As far as I'm concerned, old Brother Gray used to say the only organism from heaven and the only one going back. And there's a lot of truth in that. We were born in heaven and we're going back to heaven some golden daybreak in the resurrection. The church is the body of Christ and the bride and it's God's will that we congregate on the first day of the week to worship and to sing and to tithe and to fellowship and to evangelize and to teach and on down the line. Not just one. If evangelism is the old thrust of a local church, why, why would we keep this building up? If evangelism is the only uh, thrust of a local church, why not just send you out with a handful of gospel tracts and a Bible and let you go from door to door? How long would you last if there were no filling station to come back to? How long would you last out there in an unfriendly world if there were no believers you could brush shoulders with and no choir you could sing with and no preacher that could preach to you and exhort you? You wouldn't last long if you have any judgment. You know that. So God was divinely wise, I believe sincerely, when he instituted the church. And not only did he institute the church for evangelism, but he instituted the church for teaching as well. The ministry of teaching is the ministry of a local church. Now, having said those words by way of introduction, let me read from Hebrews 5, 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And you are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of God, in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. Being a baby, he's not able to take anything but milk. He's not able to take meat. But meat, but strong meat, belongeth to them that are of full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And you get your senses, spiritual senses, physical senses, uh, smell, feel, see, touch, physical senses, but we have spiritual senses. And my spiritual senses is what the Bible calls discernment. And my spiritual senses can be so trained and so exercised that I can discern both good and evil without any difficulty, you see. But that comes by those and from those who by reason of use 
have exercised their senses to be able to discern. Now this comes by strong meat and not by milk, by the teaching of the Word of God and not casually nor automatically. Your children that sit with you in this auditorium today are not going to automatically become a student of the Word of God. They're not going to automatically learn spiritual values. If they become a student of the Word of God and learn spiritual values, they're going to have to have a program to teach that. They're going to have to apply themselves to learning that. It's going to take sweat and toil and money and labor to teach your children and the converts the things that be of God. Now, you cannot deny that. It doesn't come automatically. Suppose you had a child born into your home and you said to yourself, I don't think I'll ever send this child to school. I believe I'll let this child grow naturally and acquire knowledge naturally. And I think I'll just bypass the school and when my little boy or girl is six years old, instead of sending them away five days a week, I think I'll keep them at my side. Now, you'd be foolish to do that. Foolish. When a child becomes a certain age, it becomes ready to learn, to learn some things. And your children need to learn like all other children need to learn. And under six is probably not able to learn. But at a given point in its life, its brain is so developed until now it can be impressed by facts and by history and by English and by knowledge. And so you send them to school to teach that child the things that they're going to need in this course of life. Every child will have to sign its name somewhere down the line. Who would want to father a child who would make an X mark for his signature all his life? Well, somebody's got to teach that child how to write his name. Every once in a while, my, my granddaughter, my youngest grandchild, until the uh, twins came along, I, I, she comes to me, and she did last Sunday. I sat here, and she came to me and hugged me and kissed me. And I whispered to her, what's your name? Well, I knew what her name was. She knew what her name was. But I wanted her to tell me. She said, my name is Abby. Well, I said, Abby what? And I made her spell it out to me, Abby Seidler. Well, somebody had to teach her that. And somebody had to teach her to write that, you see. And we'd be a foolish grandparent to think all that's going to come automatically. It doesn't come autom automatically, not at all. A child will never learn English automatically. A child will never learn history automatically. A child will never learn geography automatically. A child will never amount to anything in this life automatically. Somebody must teach and pay the job, uh, pay for the job and sweat and toil in the process. Amen? So far, so good. No complaint. Nobody objecting to what I've said so far. No, you couldn't object to what I've said because you know what I'm saying is so. Teaching, learning is not accident. Learning is not natural. Learning is sweat. Education is sweat. Knowledge is sweat. God bless these teachers in our Christian day school at Tabernacle. God bless these Sunday school teachers in our Sunday school at Tabernacle. God bless you, everyone. God bless you, departmental workers who bury yourselves in the Carol and Grace building, or bury yourselves in the J.E. Sparks building, or bury yourself in the Thomas Randall building, Sunday after Sunday. You don't have the joy of coming to this auditorium and sitting with the adult class, or one of the other adult classes, but you bury yourself in these departments, and they are wonderful. Don't get the idea that there's anything wrong with our departmentalized Sunday school. It's up to par. Some of the finest equipment I've ever seen in my life, clean and well-kept, well garnished or well polished, everything is all right at Tabernacle. Wherever your child may be, in any department, the equipment is ideal. But I'm talking about the teachers. What would we have in those buildings without a woman, without a man, without a program, without a lesson? Why? You couldn't, you'd get nothing from the educational program of our church if you just sent the people to the Carol and Grace building. That's it. No, oh, there's somebody in those classrooms and there's somebody in those assemblies that takes the Bible and patiently, Sunday after Sunday, patiently teaches your children, my children, the Word of God. Thank God for teachers like that. 
And you can't get along without that. No way a church could survive without that. Now, you wouldn't call that evangelism. No. If we, if we turn our Sunday school into an evangelistic program, we cut our nose off to spot our face. That's foolish. Now, Sunday school is one channel. Evangelism is another channel. Now, I have no objection to a Sunday school child being saved in the junior department, and that happens oftentimes. These teachers watch, and they lead children to Christ in that Sunday school, and I'm for that 100%, and we've baptized but many a child saved in one of the departments in one of the Sunday school buildings. I'm for that. But to turn all of that entirely, 100%, into an evangelistic door would be fatal, would be wrong. That's a teaching ministry a teaching ministry. And we have a lot of money invested at Tabernacle in the teaching of God's Word. And I think I have Scripture, and I'm about to read it to you. Matthew 28, and verse number 18, 19, and 20. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said unto them, speak unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, since that's a fact, nobody will deny that. I'll, I'll literally take verse 18 at face value. No doubt in my mind. All power is given unto me, said Jesus. All power in heaven and all power in the earth. Amen. Amen. Now, because of that, therefore, verse 19, therefore, go ye, you disciples, you believers, go ye. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now that's evangelism. How can a man believe except they hear? How can they hear without a preacher? So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Go ye therefore and preach the word, teach the word, so they can intelligently accept Jesus. Teach all nations, having made converts, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son, and of the name of the Holy Ghost. Now here's my, my text, verse 20. Teaching, evangelism, verse 18, verse 19. And verse 20, teaching, the ministry of teaching. Teaching them, that is, all nations who believe, all converts who believe, or anybody else for that matter. A man doesn't necessarily have to be a convert uh, to learn the Bible. I think it'd be good for him to become a convert first. But down through the years, we've had unsaved people attend Sunday school regularly at Tabernacle. It doesn't hurt them. I'm glad for them to come. They can learn about David and Isaiah and Elijah, as well as the saved man. I'd recommend, first of all, you get born again. But it wouldn't hurt an unsaved man to learn the Bible. For what I'm concerned. I've often said this, and I believe it sincerely. No man is educated until he knows something about the Bible. Now, I don't care whether you come to Tabernacle Bible College or Bob Jones University or go to the University of South Carolina or Clemson University. You're not educated at Clemson nor the University of South Carolina if you haven't had some Bible in the process. And so I say to you, it wouldn't hurt anybody to learn about the Bible. But certainly we that are converts, we that are disciples of our Lord, and I am, having believed years ago, I am a disciple. I want to look, I want to know, I want to learn all I can learn about Jesus and about the Bible. Therefore, the Great Commission commands that we're to teach them, the converts, to observe all things. Now that's very important, to observe all things. That, that's a well-rounded program. That's a well-rounded teaching program. I don't buy the idea. I heard one man one time, you, this is hard to believe. But I heard it one time, a pulpit, that that meant that we're to make converts and then teach them how to win somebody else. Now, that's a simplified explanation of that verse if I've ever heard one. I don't buy that. I think the very fact that the Scripture verse says, teaching them to observe all things, all things, includes baptism, includes communion, includes eschatology, it includes ecclesiology, it includes every doctrine of the Bible. Everything in this book is to be taught to the disciples. Not just evangelism, but everything is to be taught.
to the disciples. You have any objection to that? Now, you mothers, God bless you. I appreciate you bringing your babies. Thank you for carrying them out when they become noisy. Thank you for doing that. Feel free. Just take them out if they get noisy. But I think that teaching implies everything, everything. I have no right in this pulpit to neglect the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. I have no right in this pulpit to neglect that communion table. What would you think of a local church that never had communion? I wouldn't be a part of it. I have no right to neglect that baptistry. And I wouldn't be a member of a church that didn't have a baptistry. I was in a church the other day, and they had a baptismal fount, F-O-N-F-O-U-N-T, I think is the way it's spelled. Baptismal fount about the size of a good wash basin where the preacher reached down and wet his fingers and I don't want that. I, I think we ought to have what we have, a baptistry. And I don't think it ought to be neglected. People ought to be taught what it's there for, what comes from it, and why we do it. So we're to teach them to serve all things. Whatsoever I've commanded you, everything you've heard from me, everything I've taught you, you in turn are to teach that to the disciples. Now you couldn't expound that verse any other way. And if you narrow down your teaching ministry only to eschatology, then you've neglected a lot of other things. If you narrow down your teaching ministry only to some pet doctrine, then you've neglected a lot of other things. You're to teach everything Jesus taught his disciples. And you find a record of that in the four gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles. And you find an explanation of it in the epistles of the New Testament. And my whole life been wrapped up in teaching everything that Christ has observed us to teach. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now there's the teaching ministry. Now that's part of the Great Commission, just as much as preaching, just as much as baptizing, and just as much as going. If we had a missionary on foreign field today, one, that I knew never observed communion, I'd withdraw support from them. If we had one missionary on the foreign field who made converts and neglected to baptize them, if I found it out, we'd cut the support off. I don't want that. If we had one missionary on the field that made converts and did not institute a local church, I'd withdraw his support. I believe converts ought to be gathered together in a local church for fellowship and for teaching and for preaching and for the propagation of the gospel. And so the ministry of teaching is vitally involved. Now let me say a thing or two about the ministry of teaching. Number one, I believe that the ministry of teaching involves those who need to be taught. And basically, simply, that means all converts need to be taught, just like all children need to be taught. All converts need to be taught the whole counsel of God. The children, the new converts, the saint of God are those that need to be taught. Now I've seen some people in my lifetime that knew very little about the Bible. I, I tell this a lot of times, you don't know who I'm talking about, but one time this person was a member of our church, no longer, I've been many years ago, this happened 25 years ago, but we made a convert here at Tabernacle and baptized that convert and one day that convert met me in the hallway between this building and the, and the chapel. And they said to me, and I'll, I'll just say they, you don't know what's a man or woman. Uh, Pastor, what do you mean by being a tither? Well, I knew what that person was trying to say. And so I said to me, a tither a means to give 10% of your income to the Lord every single week. Just bring it in, put it in an envelope, turn it in every week. And they said, well, we want to be a tither. Well, I was more interested in that 10% than I was in English lesson. So I said, you become a tither. So she became a tither. And I think, ladies, she found out the word is tithing and not tithing. But the 10% bought just as much tithing as it did tithing. We need to teach people the word of God, you see. And they learn, they learn. They hang around, they learn what tithing is all about. I believe tithing is, is an essential part of the program of teaching the Word of God. My mother taught me to tithe when I was a lad. 
My pastors taught me the tithe when I was a young man. My wife and I agreed to tithe when we were first married. And down through the years, we agreed we were going to tithe if we starved to death. Amen. And we've tithed, and I've gotten fat. She's kept hers, but I, <laughs> I've lost mine. But I believe God blesses a whole council preaching, you see. Tithe it. Tithe it. All right. Those need to be taught. Children need to be taught. I'm a little bit jealous of the children. I don't want you to take them away from me. You teachers, I'm jealous of you. You have them for an hour on Sunday morning, and I'm glad you do, but I'm a bit jealous of you. Don't take them away from me for preaching, please. After you've had them for an hour, you bring them out in this auditorium. Don't give me a children's church, but I want a family church. I want mom and daddy in the building, and I want the children in the building. I want the grandkids in the building. Oh, but they'll cry. So what? You heard babies cry. This is not a funeral home. This is a local church. <laughs> so I want those children to hear the word. I want them to be taught. It's partly my responsibility like it belongs to the teachers. And I pray for you teachers. I prayed for you yesterday. I pray for you almost every day, the teachers in our Sunday school. Those who are to be taught are the children, the new converts, as well as the saints of God. I had a lady come to me one time. He said, now, preacher, I don't quite understand about tithing. Am I to tithe what I carry home? Or am I to tithe my uh, gross income, my big income, without uh, nothing taken from it? And that person, I found out, had been tithing only their net income. And they had not tithed their taxes and their insurance and their other benefits. I think that's wrong. You ought to tithe your insurance, you ought to tithe your taxes, you ought to tithe your, your benefits, whatever it may be. If you get an inheritance, you ought to tithe the inheritance. If you get a gift, somebody gives you a hundred dollars, you ought to give tithe that hundred dollars. Right. Everything that's an increase is to be tithed. Now saints need to be taught that. Children need to be taught that. Tithe it. Many other things. And then the second thing I want you to note, those who are to do the teacher, teaching. Who are the teachers in this great program of the ministry of teaching? Now, I read to you a while ago in Hebrews chapter 5 where Paul said, uh, some of you ought to be teachers by this time. You should have grown and matured to the point that you're teachers, but you have need that should be taught. Now, that's a sad commentary, and I read that uh, section on purpose. I don't want that to be so about our people at Tabernacle. It said about a deacon and a bishop apt to teach, A-P-T, apt to teach. And that word APT means ready to teach. Every man that says ought to be ready to teach. Always, especially if he's a bishop, he ought to be ready to teach. Ready to preach, sure, but ready to teach. Every man. And so, who are, who are to do the teaching? Those that are strong, those made strong by the meat of God's word, those that are matured to a point, those that are are uh, trained teachers, learning, having learned themselves, those that are matured teachers, having developed themselves, and those that are true teachers, having been zealous to be faithful to the whole counsel of God. You certainly don't want to put a false prophet up. Not by any means. You don't put a false prophet. If a man doesn't read the Bible, he ought not teach. If he questions the scriptures, he ought not to teach. If he's not a fundamentalist, he doesn't teach at Tabernacle. Right. He's to be proven true to teach how important that is. Now, what's to be taught? In our ministry of teaching, what are we to teach? Now, this may sound a little bit trite to some of you, but I submit to you, first of all, that all of our people ought to be taught history. What about that? You'd think I'd say that to the high school students or to the Bible college students. But I believe every child ought to be taught elementary facts about history. I don't think you can understand this book without knowing something about the Caesars of Rome. You'll not understand this book without understanding something about the Dark Ages. You'll not understand this book without understanding something about the Roman Catholic Church. You'll not understand this book without understanding something about the Inquisition history. 
And it's a very vital thing. It's not a matter of option. Not only ought we know when Columbus discovered America or when our nation was founded, those are basic truths of history, but we also ought to know who John Huss was and who Martin Luther was and who John Knox was. Right. And we need to know, know who John the Baptist was. We need to know some facts of history. And it takes time to teach that and learn that. And you not, you'll not know the Bible till you've learned history. A person came to me the other day and said, we plan to go to Israel. I said, it'll be the best thing that ever happened to you. Go by all means. Go by all means. And I said, when you spend 10 days in Israel, your Bible will change from black and white to beautiful color. You'll learn history on those 10 days that you'd never learn any other way. And, and it'll become real to you like you'd never get it out of a history book. You go, by all means. Now, the reason I, and I said to that person, 10 days in Israel is worth a year in any seminary in the world, in my judgment. And the reason is because of the historical connection. It just fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. It comes together, and it comes together more easy once you've been there and walked where Jesus walked and lived where the apostles lived. It's wonderful, history. And then second, we're to teach doctrine. Now, I, when I was a teenager, I, I'd go to sleep on that idea. I used to say to my pastor, he'd say, open your Bible to Romans, and I'd say, I wish you wouldn't. Tell me about Joseph. Tell me about Moses. I'd rather hear about the personalities. But my old pastor knew what I needed, and he held my feet over the fire of doctrine. And I rise up to call him blessed. We need to teach the doctrine of the Trinity. We need to teach the doctrine of the devil. We need to teach the doctrine of the virgin birth. We need to teach the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ. We need to teach the doctrine of the resurrection. We need to teach the doctrine of the second advent. We need to teach the doctrine of the judgment seat of Christ. We need to teach the doctrine of the white throne judgment. We need to teach the doctrine of the holy city. We need to teach the doctrine of the millennium. And on down the line, long list of doctrines, doctrines. You say, that's so hard. Yes, I'm sure it's hard. Some words are more difficult to get than simple words are. But we need the hard words like we need the simple words. We need the doctrines like I need John 3.16. I need the doctrines of the Bible. All of the doctrines of the Bible. What don't we teach? We'll teach typology. You'll not understand this Bible. No person will. No person will without some knowledge of types. And the more you know about typology in the Old Testament, the more the New Testament opens up to you and you can understand the truth of God. Now, you don't stumble on that. You don't get that when you go to the pastor, with the pastor into the baptistry. You get that the hard way. By sweat and by thought and by reading and by study. Doctrines, typology, typology. That ought to be taught in our school, in our church school. In January, the Lord willing, Brother Clark's been working on it. We plan to bring uh, Dr. Everett Smith from Orlando to our Bible college and to our church. And he has a display of ancient Bibles. He told Brother Clark in the letter, I need 60 feet of table space. That means across this auditorium from over where Brother Arthur sits to over here on this side, we'll need 60 feet of table space. And he has all ancient scrolls and manuscripts enough to fill that big table. And some of them dating back a thousand years. So the Old Testament scrolls are longer. He has some original copies of the first Bibles ever printed on a printing press. And we'll be able to see all those. And he's going to lecture to us about those Bibles. Show us how he got our Bible as we now have it in our hands. Now, that's, that's important. That's good. And we're going to the trouble to bring that man to our church because we feel that our people need to know those things, you see. I need to know them, and you need to know them. And we plan to do that long about the latter part of January, the Lord willing. Then we're to teach prophecy, the second coming. Everybody in this church needs to be able to talk prophecy, teach prophecy. You ought to be able to rightly divide the word of truth about things yet to come about the second advent, about the rapture, about the mark of the beast, about the antichrist, 
about Ezekiel's battle of 38 and 39, about Armageddon, about the middle tribulation, abomination of desolation. All those things you ought to be familiar with. We're to teach that. And then we're to teach also evangelism. Reaching out. And then we're to teach missions. And yet that's another message that I want to bring later. Now the last thing, the means of this teaching. How can we do it? What's the means? I think all of us will agree that it's a vital part of our church program, the teaching aspect. Now what's the means of it? Number one, the home. I think the basic unit of learning is the home. The mother has that baby before the teacher ever enjoys that child. The mother teaches that child from the time it first begins to smile, from the day it first begins to observe and focus its eyes. The mother begins to teach. The father begins to teach. And there's nothing more important than the home in the process of teaching. You mothers that have children are to teach those little ones to the best of your ability as long as they're in your hand. And then you're to help them once they start to school. Another means is our Sunday school. I believe in Sunday school. And Sunday school at Tabernacle is not a picnic. Sunday school is a study program. Sunday school at Tabernacle is a systematic, verse by verse, book by book study of the Bible. Sunday school at Tabernacle is an all Bible agency. No literature, just the Bible, teaching the Word of God. That's the means. And then further, the church. This pulpit is a place where the scripture ought to be taught. I know it ought to be exhorted and it ought to be proclaimed, but the scripture ought to be taught from the pulpit as well. Line upon line, precept upon precept. That's one of the reasons we're bringing Brother Smith. We want him to teach us how our King James Bible came to us as it is. That's good information, and we need to know it. And I think he knows how, how what he's talking about. And so we'll have that joy. We need to teach many other things from the pulpit. And then our Christian school. That's another means. At Tabernacle, we have the joy of a Christian day school where we teach the Genesis account of creation. I feel a bit sorry for children that have to sit in a high school uh, class of science with a te teacher smoking a cigarette and using sometimes bad words and they talk about evolution. And talk about it as if it's a matter of fact. I'm so glad that in our Christian day school, they're not subjected to that humanistic idea. But a scriptural idea, a scriptural fact as to creation. Our Christian day school is a means of, of teaching. Now, I, I preach the whole sermon to get across to you the fact that a vital fruit of tabernacle and a vital part of our church is teaching the Word of God. We don't teach Shakespeare. I'm not interested in that. And we're not teaching social sciences per se. I'm not interested in that. We're not teaching political science. We're not teaching military science. But we're teaching the Word of God. And that's the important thing. And that's our charge. This is our responsibility. This is our privilege. Teach them to observe all things. Thank God for a Bible teaching ministry. May we stand with our heads bowed. Our Father, help us to see the varied aspects of the fruit of a local church. Help us not to decry any one area. Thank God for evangelism. Thank God for Bible conferences. And thank God for tithing messages, for all the messages. We don't want to minimize one or exalt another. But we'd like that the Word of God be taught fairly and honestly and from a well-rounded approach throughout the Sunday School at Tabernacle. May it be so, at the pulpit as well. Bless our people that we might take the strong meat and become strong thereby, we pray. The heads are bowed. We're going to sing an invitation song. There will be somebody in the church that's neglected the Bible. You might ought to come to God, confess it, ask Him to forgive you. You're welcome to come to the prayer altar if God leads you. Maybe someone who'd love to become part of our church by transfer of letter or by baptism. If so, you may come forward. Sing choir. Just step forward right now by the horn and by the clock here. 
ready to receive you and help you in a way that we possibly can. We invite you to come. As God may lead, we invite you to come. Amen. Come on. God bless you, dear brother. God bless you. One more stands there. Come right, come right now. God leads. This will be the last stands there. Do you have a need that could be met at the altar? Father, we thank you for thy word. Thank you for our people. Thank you for the great teacher, the blessed Holy Spirit. Take the things of God and teach them to us that we might become strong and our spiritual senses become exercised by the word of God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.